Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Medical Center Hour. Our program today is the annual Kopaka Family Foundation Lecture in the Medical Humanities. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the School of Medicine. And we're delighted to bring you these weekly Medical Center Hours, including such special lectures as this Kopaka Family Foundation Lecture. The lectureship is grounded in the Kopaka family's passion for improving patient care, especially for improving clinicians' communication with patients and families. I'll give you just a quick note on the lecture's origins. The wife and children of Dr. Kopaka Rao established the Kopaka Family Foundation in his memory in 2002, I think. A medicinal chemist who rose from impoverished beginnings in a village in India to earn advanced degrees in science, Dr. Kopaka Rao emigrated to the U.S., where he built a career in pharmaceutical research and as a professor of pharmacy. He cared deeply about scientific discovery, teaching, and being a good person. He and his wife raised three children, two of whom, Jaya Rao and Ram Kapaka, became physicians. Jaya Rao, who is here with us today, um, welcome, did her internal medicine residency here at UVA. So when she comes to these lectures, it's a bit of a homecoming for her and for us. Uh, sadly, Dr. Kopaka Rao's last illness was so tragically troubling that in 2002, his two physician children wrote an impassioned essay for the Annals of Internal Medicine about how their father's care, their care team uh, communication with the family uh, could have, should have, and indeed would have been better had those health professionals known more about and attended to their patient as a person. Our COPAC lectures over the years have been, uh, our lecturers have been persons of varied professional preparations, uh, people whose work explores the many dynamics of how human beings, uh, particularly patients, families, and teams of caregivers, relate to one another. For purposes of these lectures, we've defined communication broadly as verbal, but also as so much more. And we've looked especially to how persons express care and connectedness toward one another. This year, though, we've turned things inside out to focus on communication that's difficult, that potentially divides, that voices bias and negativity in ways that derail trustful interactions and threaten to disrupt care. In our society at large, but also pointedly in healthcare settings, including this one, We've noticed an uptick in discriminatory remarks by patients, comments directed at clinicians and other staff at all levels, based on those professionals' race and eth ethnicity. How do we understand, and crucially, how do we respond? UVA has been addressing this ominous situation with a positive new initiative called All In that provides health professionals at all levels with practical training in handling discriminatory behaviors. All In, which is spearheaded by Peggy Plews Ogan, who's here with us today, is mentioned in your handout, also with some contact information. So we welcome today two distinguished scholars who've taken up this challenge in their Copaca lecture, which is titled, Dealing with Racist Comments by Patients, Dilemmas in the Hospital and Society. Bernard Lowe, on my far right, is a physician and bioethicist who is now president of the Greenwall Foundation, which supports a rich array of work in bioethics. Kimani Paul Emile, uh, on my immediate right, works at the critical intersection of health law, bioethics, and race. She's an American studies scholar and a lawyer and a professor of law at Fordham University. She's associate director of that law school's Center on Race, Law, and Justice and co-director of Fordham Stein Center for Law and Ethics. She and her work have enjoyed support from the Greenwall Foundation. I'd like to quickly add that neither speaker had any conflicts of interest to declare. So um, now we start our Kapaka lecture. Welcome to Bernie and Kamani.
Okay, thank you for that lovely introduction and for inviting us here today. Good afternoon. Um, we're very pleased to be here today to talk about an important issue that's been getting a lot of attention lately, and that's what to do when the patient is racist, and what are the legal, clinical, and ethical implications for patients, providers, and healthcare institutions. So let's start with a scenario. Okay, so a 57-year-old man enters the emergency department late one night with shortness of breath and a fever. A nurse does an initial workup. She thinks his condition could be serious, so she goes to get Dr. Jones, who's a physician on call. She gets her to evaluate, the, she calls her so she can come evaluate the patient. When Dr. Jones enters the room, the patient says, oh, I'm so glad you're finally here. My television hasn't been working. Can you just, can you please fix it? Dr. Jones explains that she's his physician and she's here to evaluate him, and the patient gets agitated and turns to the nurse and says, I don't want to be treated by any black, patient, black doctors. Get this woman out of my room. I want a white doctor. Now, you can fill in the, the blank here with, uh, with respect to the rejected physician. It could be an Asian physician, a Latino physician, a Muslim physician. Any of these categories apply. And scenarios such as this are much more common than one would think and occur at hospitals throughout the country. In fact, I call it one of medicine's open secrets because you'd be hard pressed to find a physician, particularly a physician of color, who hasn't had this experience or who doesn't know someone who has. And the issue has gotten a lot of attention lately due to the changing social and political climate as evidenced by recent events um, throughout the nation, including here in Charlottesville. And what makes these physician-patient encounters so challenging is that they raise many thorny legal, ethical, and clinical challenges for all the parties involved. So for example, physicians have an obligation to treat all patients, even those patients they find distasteful. But these encounters can be painful and degrading for the rejected physician. And these scenarios are particularly difficult when the patient is stable, but not competent enough to be sent, uh, 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 it's, it's competent but not stable enough to be sent elsewhere. So before we get too far into this, I want to take a moment to identify the groups that are most directly uh, implicated when these physician-patient encounters occur, along with their rights and responsibilities. So um, let's start. So we have patients, healthcare providers, and healthcare institutions. Let's start with patients. So, Patients have a right to receive stabilizing treatment, and this is in keeping with the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, EMTALA, which requires hospitals to screen and stabilize patients if necessary in an emergency situation, or to arrange for a transfer with patient consent to a facility able to provide appropriate care. Patients also have informed consent rights, uh, which, so they have the right to refuse medical treatment, which includes the right to refuse wanted treatment from an unwanted physician. This right to refuse is a well-respected legal and ethical principle that's based in informed consent and legal rules that protect patients from battery, which is unwanted touching. Many hospitals also have patient bill of rights documents, which include explicit language about a patient's right to refuse uh, treatment from an unwanted physician. So I was recently up at the Brigham and uh, took a picture of theirs, and you see at the bottom it says here, you have the right to refuse to be observed, examined, or treated by students or any other staff without jeopardizing your access to care. So now let's turn to physicians uh, and healthcare workers in general. So healthcare workers have a duty to treat, but they also have employment rights that have to be respected. And these rights include uh, the right to a workplace free from certain types of discrimination, discrimination on the, uh, the basis of race, sex, religion, ethnicity, these are considered protected classifications, legally protected classifications. All right. And we have healthcare institutions. What are their interests and obligations? Healthcare institutions have to meet EMTALA requirements. Okay. So again, this is the federal anti-dumping statute, which protects patients from being dumped from hospitals based on, without being first screened and stabilized. Um, and institutions also have to protect the employment right to their employees. So for example, institutions can't force their healthcare workers to either treat or refrain from treating patients who've rejected them based on race or ethnicity, because to do so might create a, a hostile work environment in violation of employment laws. Okay, so here we have everybody's rights and responsibilities. So at this point, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, this is straightforward, I get it. But it actually gets murkier the deeper you go. So for example, 
With respect to patients, should the race or ethnicity of the patient matter with respect to how we deal with these cases? So should we distinguish among different types of patients making these types of requests or exhibiting bias? And on the medical provider side, should different types of medical professionals have different rights and obligations? So should we distinguish between nurses and physicians and others um, in these cases? And what about healthcare institutions? Are they damned if they do, damned if they don't? If they accommodate a patient's wishes for a doctor of a different race or ethnicity, are they discriminating against the assigned physician and opening themselves up to li legal liability? But if they don't accommodate the patient's demands, will they be violating laws against battery by forcing the patient to be treated by an unwanted doctor without consent? But on the other hand, if they don't screen and stabilize the patient, will they be violating EMTALA? So it's complicated, right? What do you do? There haven't been many clear guidelines on how to effectively balance all of these concerns. So my co-authors, um, Alicia Fernandez, Alex Smith, and uh, Dr. Lowe, and I pro uh, provide guidelines in an article we published in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Dealing with Racist Patients. And prior to this, I published a lengthier piece that was published in the UCA Law Review that laid out the legal, uh, the legal ramifications of accommodating patients' racial preferences. And I have to say, when I first heard about these kinds of physician-patient encounters, um, I was shocked. And my first instinct was this type of behavior shouldn't happen, and if it does, it most certainly shouldn't be accommodated. Um, as you know, I'm a law professor, and I research and write on issues that occur at the intersection of race, um, biomedical ethics, um, and, and health law. So I decided to research the issue. And I initially focused my research on identifying the laws that could be used to address this type of behavior. And this led me to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's a federal law that bars discrimination on the basis of sex, race, ethnicity, and religion. And one provision, Title VII of the Act, addresses discrimination in employment. Among other things, it says that employers can't cater to the discriminatory preferences of their clientele. So um, if you went to a restaurant and you told the proprietor that you only wanted to be treated by uh, or served by white waiters, um, if the proprietor accommodated your request, then uh, she would be liable for violating Title VII. So this sounds a lot like our hospital scenario. So I assumed I'd find some case law here. But as it turned out, there wasn't any. There hadn't been any reported cases of uh, a physicians challenging the accommodation of patient racial preferences under Title VII. And this is so even though we know these, times of these types of physician-patient encounters occur. But there have been several cases brought by another group of healthcare professionals rejected by patients on the basis of race or ethnicity. Can you, can you guess what other group of healthcare professionals I'm talking about? Nurses. nurses, exactly, nurses and nursing assistants. And part of the reason that nurses tend to, uh, the reason we're seeing this uh, discrepancy is that nurses tend to be employees of the medical institutions where they work, while physicians are more likely to be independent contractors. So if a hospital or another healthcare institution like a nursing home um, complies with a patient's demands and reassigns a nurse, then the nurse's employment rights are violated. Title VII is violated. But for physicians, in order to maintain their independent contractor status, hospitals can't have too much say or control over the manner and means by which they do their work. So, and, so e and even considering that, uh, physicians tend to have more autonomy to make these types of decisions. So that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing physicians suing as often, is because they're generally making these decisions amongst themselves, um, and that's why they're not suing. But so in broad strokes, that's the legal landscape for healthcare providers and healthcare institutions. But it doesn't answer the threshold normative question of whether they should accommodate. So to get at this, let's, let's go to patients. Now, the case I opened with is what I imagine many people envision when they think about patients rejecting doctors based on race or ethnicity. But these cases can look quite different. So we're going to go through three case studies. So this one, here we have an older Korean man who goes to the hospital with symptoms that suggest uh, congestive heart failure. He's provided treatment that offers a very good chance of success, and he'd likely make a full recovery. And all seems to be going well until one day he says he only wants to be treated by doctors in suits. The staff is puzzled by this request and is ultimately denied. The patient then becomes increasingly withdrawn and eventually refuses treatment altogether. The hospital performs a competency test. He's found to be competent. 
So they respect his wishes as they must, and all treatment has stopped. Now, this would have been the end of it had someone not noticed that he had filled out a form requesting full resuscitation should he go into cardiopulmonary arrest. When confronted with the seeming contradiction and after some prodding, he asked whether they had noticed that his treating physicians had either been Japanese or Japanese-American or of Japanese descent. The hospital was in Hawaii, which has a large Japanese-American population, and the patient was Korean and elderly and remembered Imperial Japan and said he didn't trust his physicians. He didn't believe they had his best interests in mind. And the reason why he wanted to be treated by physicians in suits was that he noticed that a higher percentage of the non-Japanese American physicians wore suits because they also taught in the medical school. So it was sort of his way of uh, making his, his request a little more PC or more palatable. Okay, so we're gonna return to these. Let's go on to case study three. Here we have an African American woman. She presents with symptoms that suggest renal failure, and she's fairly uncommunicative with her assigned physician. She's giving very reluctant yes and no answers to their questions as they try to take her history. And at some point during the process, she sees an African-American doctor treating another patient. And she points and says, I want to be treated by him. Why might this patient be discriminating? Anyone? Exactly. Perhaps she'd had a positive prior experience with an African-American doctor. Perhaps she'd had a negative prior experience with a non-African-American doctor. But maybe it's simple prejudice. At this point, we don't know. Okay. All right, case study four. The patient is Latina. She arrives in the ER after two weeks of rhinorrhea, sinus pain, and other symptoms suggestive of viral sinusitis. And as she's getting her history taken, she declares she does not want the assigned Latino physician. She wants an American doctor, which turns out to mean Anglo-American. And when asked why she's making this request, she responds that she came to the United States because she thought she believed things would be better here, uh, better facilities, better treatments, better doctors. And she associates American doctors with white doctors. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. How is the patient's request in scenario three different from all the others? Anybody catch it? How is it different? Exactly. That's, you guys are on. This is good. OK, that's right. So she's not so much rejecting a position as she's asking for concordance. Right? We see this with women who want a female OBGYN. Right? We see this with some uh, Muslim patients who might want a religiously or culturally concordant physician. So in this way, it's a little bit different. But it's still discrimination. Okay. Let's go back to case study two for a moment. Physicians may see a similar version of this among veterans who don't want to be treated by a physician who reminds them of a former enemy combatant. Okay. Now, perhaps it's bias, but maybe it's PTSD. So we can argue that discrimination is bad, and it often is, but the idea of discrimination becomes much more complicated in the clinical medical context, particularly in emergency situations where you can't simply tell the, the patient to, to take the doctor they've been assigned or to, or to leave. Sometimes the patient's behavior very clearly seems to be based on bigotry or animus. Um, but other times, it looks a little different. So what might the patients, particularly patients in case study two and three, be looking for? What might they be looking for? Safety, trust. Yeah, safety, trust, exactly. Um, you all know that this sense of trust is a very important part of the physician-patient relationship. Um, and this is particularly true from patients who are from underserved communities or marginalized communities. Many studies show that they're not as trusting of the healthcare system. And this feeling of mistrust that we see among members of racial minority groups isn't just random paranoia. Studies show that members of these groups have very good reason not to trust the healthcare system. Overwhelming evidence shows that racial and ethnic minorities still tend to receive poorer quality health care as compared to whites, even when factors such as insurance status are controlled. And some of this is due to structural factors. Um, but research also shows that, sadly, there's still a lot of racial bias in medical practice. And minority patients disproportionately receive sub substandard care due to physician prejudice. Several studies 
several studies, uh, oh, several recent reviews of physician bias published in very well-respected journals found that physicians had a preference for white, all physicians had a preference for white patients. And this was particularly so among uh, white physicians. And this also, not all physicians, but disproportionately. Um, and they also found that this bias uh, likely affects diagnosis, care, and health outcomes. However, data also shows that for some patients, particularly patients of color, physician-patient race concordance can counter the effects of patient uh, physician bias, stereotyping, and discrimination. It also tends to promote uh, greater trust, greater communication, and greater pat patient satisfaction. And all of this goes to the core of the physician-patient relationship. Now, this doesn't mean that we should default to race concordant physician-patient relationships. Instead, all of this goes to say that although our first instinct, when we hear about patients bringing their biases into the hospital, making these types of demands, our first instinct might be simply to, re to reject their requests. But in order to provide appropriate care to all patients, it may be necessary to distinguish between garden variety racism and patients seeking a healthcare worker who they feel will understand their experience, who will show them respect, and whom they can trust. So the question then becomes, how can this be accomplished? How can you distinguish between these two types of reassignment requests, and then how should you respond to them? To get at this, my co-authors and I um, devised five ethical guidelines and these, uh, that lay out factors that should be considered. These include consideration of the patient's medical condition, an assessment of the patient's decision-making capacity, the, figuring out the reason for the request, the physician's options for responding, and the effect on the physician. And these guidelines can be helpful as you engage the patient through negotiation, persuasion, and then if necessary, negotiation. And Dr. Lowe will spend some time talking, going into more detail about these factors. Um, because they, they might seem fairly straightforward, but they require some unpacking. Take, for example, the determination for the request. Um, as we've seen, that's not always so clear cut. So for example, we have the first case study, fix my TV, maybe it's bigotry. Second case study, no Japanese American doctors, maybe it's PTSD. Second one, I want a black doctor. Is this patient seeking racial or, or ethnic concordance because of issues of trust? And finally, I want an American doctor. Uh, is, this, is this based on a misleading understanding of the physician's qualifications? You'll also notice at the bottom of the chart, it says um, accommodation is sometimes acceptable. Um, and for the patient in case study two, the African American, the, the Korean gentleman, that's in fact what the physicians did. They accommodated his request, he accepted care, he made a full recovery, and eventually went home. Okay. So accommodation isn't, it clearly isn't a perfect solution. And it obviously isn't a satisfa satisfying answer to the problem of physician bias and its effects. And none of this is su to suggest that we shouldn't be concerned about bigotry and racism on the part of some patients or cases where the patient isn't just requesting concordance, but is explicitly rejecting a doctor or a healthcare worker based on his or her race or ethnicity, because this tends to disproportionately and negatively affect healthcare workers of color. And each time it happens, it's like another slice of the knife, and the cumulative effect um, can, can be significant. As you can imagine, these experiences are painful and demeaning for the physician involved, and they, take a, they can exact a heavy emotional and psychological toll, and all of this contributes to burnout. I'm sure you've heard of the recent case of a pediatric resident who um, she went into the room to meet her patient. Uh, she, she introduced herself. She got down on one knee to give the patient a high five. And just as she was about to do so, the patient's father said, don't you touch my child. I want a white doctor. Now, even if the resident decides she no longer wants to work with this family, um, the episode isn't over for her. The emotional and psychological weight of the encounter will linger. Today, we're in a patient-centered culture of care, which is important, but we can't forget our first-line providers, which are, tend to be nurses and trainees, residents and students. So when these cases arise, there has to be a formalized process in place, and this is particularly important when we're dealing with trainees. A 2016 study found that 93% of over 400 first-year residents had experienced disruptive behavior, uh, patient behavior, including racial bias. 
Among these, 50% didn't know how to respond, while 25% believed that nothing would be done if they had alerted hospital leadership. So this tells us something. There doesn't seem to be enough institutional support for frontline providers. They need to know that the institution has their back. So what can we do? First, when an incident occurs, if a supervisor is present with a trainee, then she may want to wait a moment to see how the trainee wants to respond, or if the trainee wants to handle the situation uh, herself. And if not, then the supervisor has to step in and let the patient know that all the trainees are perfectly qualified to be treating patients, and that hateful speech won't be condoned or permitted. If the attending or the supervisor is, uh, is uh, able, and this isn't always possible, but if she can, she may want to excuse herself um, with the trainee and ask how and whether the trainee wants to proceed. Uh, but whatever they decide, it's imperative that the supervisor model appropriate behavior. After the event, it's important to follow up and debrief by giving affected staff an opportunity to, to talk about the incident. And it's important not to minimize the encounter. This is all about taking people's difficult experiences seriously and giving them a chance to vent. In addition to debriefing with the rejected provider, the institution should also address the fact that these encounters can have a co corrosive effect on others who witness them but may not know what to do or how to respond. So you may want to have a whole team discussion. And this is important because prevention is impossible. So members of the team are probably going to have this experience at some point in their careers. And if they don't have this particular experience directly, they're going to witness somebody else going through it. And by these experiences, I don't just mean rejections on the basis of race or ethnicity, but I mean also um, gender presentation, disability status, age, sex, right? The team needs to learn the skills to handle these encounters. Another reason for a team meeting is that some members of the team might have, may not have any idea that, they're, um, that other, the colleagues are going through these, these experiences. So you want to bring these experiences to light, not only to inform the team, but also as a means of protecting the person who experienced it from internalizing it. Because these rejections, again, feel like an assault, and internalizing it is more likely to happen if the person feels alone in the experience, or feels like they won't be supported, or that they'll be accused of being overly sensitive. So institutions have to support staff with an eye towards crafting an appropriate future response, which can also be based on the collection of data. Um, the more information you have, the better your response will be. So you can collect data on how often these encounters occur, the institution's response, the ultimate resolution, the effect on the uh, providers, how affected personnel are supported, and how they feel about the encounter itself, as well as the institution's response. And all of this can be used to create best practices. Now, in order to be most effective, though, an, institution, an institutional response may have to include institutional culture change. As we've seen with the recent tide of sexual harassment allegations in the Me Too movement, um, many people who brought these allegations to light worked at institutions that had anti-harassment uh, policies. But there wasn't a norm of coming forward, uh, perhaps. Um, and this might be because uh, you know, people didn't feel safe reporting, or felt that their claims wouldn't be taken seriously, or maybe felt that their claims would somehow come back to bite them by negatively affecting their career trajectory. The same can be said with respect to how healthcare workers, but particularly trainees, may feel about reporting their treatment by patients. So even with the best policies and protocols in place, a, uh, a culture of non-reporting um, will undermine any kind of meaningful change. So supervisors have to be sensitive to this and work with the institution to create a norm of reporting and a culture of supporting. And finally, the medical profession as a whole has to expand cultural awareness at all levels of education and training so that providers can interact more effectively with various patient populations. And the profession has to increase diversity among its ranks, uh, particularly beginning in, medical, beginning in medical school. So this diversification uh, needs to be done with an eye towards creating a more culturally aware core of physicians. But until this happens, um, the guidelines that I've laid out uh, represent a clinically, ethically, and uh, legally appropriate means of balancing the needs of patients, providers, and healthcare institutions. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Lowe.
thanks very much, Kamani. Uh, what we'd like to do now is invite um, you in the audience to participate. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, invite those of you who have experienced these kinds of episodes, either having been the target of negative comments by patients who seek an, another provider, or if you've been in the role of being in the room when someone else was the target, uh, I want to invite you to, uh, if you're willing, please do, uh, share your experience and, and let us know what happened and, and what it was like. Uh, so just raise your hand and we have an energetic young physician who's going to uh, run around and give you the mic so everyone can hear you. And could you just please say, um, not who you are, but sort of whether you're a medical student or a nurse or a, a sure. dean of the school or something. Um, I'm an attending in pediatrics, and this is sort of, this is a story from when I was a resident, and it, it was sort of indirectly involved. Um, but I had a colleague who was a male resident who was assigned to see a patient in a continuity clinic. It was two little girls, and they could arrive with their mother. And as soon as he walked in the room, basically before he did anything, the mother immediately um, got very upset and said, I don't want you touching my children. I can't have a man touching my children. I can't have a man in this room. And sort of um, became very angry. Um, again, the physician did nothing. So he just left the room, came back to the workroom, and told us what had happened. And so we had this discussion about whether to accommodate the family, um, what might be going on there. And so we ended up accommodating. And I was the person who then went in and saw the family because the mom's main specification was that she wanted a female physician. And I never really got to the bottom of why she had made that request. But when I walked in the room, it was clear that she was very amped up and very activated. So the way we kind of framed the discussion was that Obviously, you, the male resident, did nothing wrong, but you know, could something have happened to this mom or to her kids in another situation? Um, because her reaction was so disproportionate to anything that had happened that we felt like this was probably a trauma response or something that just had nothing to do with us and that our ethical duty was to just treat the family and accommodate that request. So that's what we ended up doing. Okay, great. No, I think your point that as a physician, your first response, which I think is a good one, is to what can I do to provide the care that this patient or, or family needs? Uh, and uh, we can talk a little bit later about how you explore at a later point what was behind that request so you can better understand and better provide care. Uh, other comments, uh, questions, experiences? Yeah, down front. He's going to get his 10,000 steps he into is. this. Yes, he is. I could have walked up. Thank yeah, you. I'm a nurse, and um, I have experienced that, that not myself, but from uh, co-workers, so working as charge nurse, and particularly from nurses' aides who were refused by white patient families. And um, the way how I, we responded, I worked night shift, or I did work then night shift, so it wasn't wasn't the immediate idea to get a supervisor, which we didn't do. So we just took care of it ourselves. And for the most part, accommodated. So, mm -hmm. you know, would have exchanged the, uh, pay, the PCT, a patient care assistant, with a white pa a patient care assistant. Or in one case, I just uh, took the care over from the nurse and from the, mm -hmm. um, from the PCA, just to observe further how, these, uh, how, these, how this patient family would be um, behaving and then reported on it. Mm -hmm. And what was the but, nature of the requests people, families made? Was it a spectrum between polite to angry? No, it was rude. It was rude. We don't want any black nurse in here, or we don't want any black, any black person. No black person is touching my mother, something like that. I mean, just extremely rude. And right. so. Yeah. So I, I think that tone of really negativity and sort of putting down the person who is trying to deliver care uh, is unfortunately common. Please. I'm, uh, I'm Melissa Elliott. I'm a nurse on the psych unit. And my experience shared with my colleague was that <clears throat> she came to me, another nurse, and said, I, I cannot help this patient. She was repeatedly calling her the N-word and uh, saying other disrespectful things to her. I, I fortunately had had guests the weekend before from UCLA who had encountered exactly the same issue. 
and told me what they did. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked my colleague, would you like to try this? And she said, yes. Uh, she was from New York, actually. She was a traveler. But um, we went to the patient's room, who was completely uh, able to manage her behavior. She knew what she was doing. And I stood in the front, and my colleague Tasha was in back of me, and I said, you know, we're a team. If you cannot let Tasha comfortably work with you, I cannot work with you either. We have to be a team. This harms the way we can care for you. And, uh, and she said, Tasha said, it was the best experience she's ever had encountering racism, but what we did after that was, this happens, this happens pretty often on our unit, actually, almost always with the N-word. Mm -hmm. um, we decided that after that, when a patient was doing this, whether they had advanced dementia and, and couldn't change their behavior or whether they could, that we would speak to it and that when we went in, to, we would go together with a white person and a person of color to say with our bodies, we are a team, here we are, we're together. I asked Tasha, uh, would you rather just the white nurses care for her? You just, because we can do that. And she said, hell no, that'd be given into the racism. Let's do it together. So I think it's her call, but that was her call. Okay. So uh, if I could just, uh, if I may, just underscore a few things I thought that were really useful. First, as the uh, supervisor or charger, you got involved. You said, this is, this is my problem, this is our problem. You went in as a team. You went in literally together, and you set limits on behavior. Right? You said, we have to, if we're going to take care of you, we have to work together. And you really um, asked the person who was the target of that, what would you like us to do? Because if you want, we can make arrangements to take you off the case, which is, is what you do on, on the night shift. But I think the extent of the, it's not uncommon for patient, for the, uh, healthcare worker who's been the target of a, a, a mean and nasty attack said, no, if we're in this together, I can handle this because I don't want the patient to feel that they get rewarded in a sense or get positive feedback from what is really socially unexpected behavior in hospital. Okay, so I hope that all of us will, who will be in that role, whether you're a senior resident or an attending physician, will sort of own the, the incident and, and work on it. Okay, other, all the way in the back, please. Thank you. Ebony Hill Buckle, so I'm an anesthesiologist here. And um, throughout training, there's been a number of different instances. Of one coworker was a nurse, asked him if he would get to cleaning up the operating room, um, mistaking him for janitorial service instead of an anesthesiologist. Um, patients encounters, of course. And I think I want to echo the, the comment that was made about following up with the physician or the, or the nurse or whatever the medical um, professional is, because I don't think we take as much um, steps to look at the long-term emotional burnout that comes with having to be subject to that type of treatment from patients. Um, yes, in that one shift, she may have been okay to say, okay, I want to still work with this patient, but was she truly okay? And is there a PTSD that comes along with that same, like I said, everyday barrage of, are you good enough, the stereotype threat, and how do we manage as minority physicians working in an environment that doesn't reflect you? Okay, good. Are any of you students are still in training? And if so, would you like to talk about what it's like at the start of your careers? But please, first, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm actually an undergraduate student, okay. but I have volunteered in multiple different clinical settings at this point, and I became kind of one of our um, main senior trainees on a cancer unit for basically hospitality and services, so whatever nurses don't have time to do because they're trying to do things, you basically step in for them um, if a patient needs something. So 
there are days where I was the only one present on the unit at that time and doing rounds with patients. I had one patient who didn't have time to eat breakfast for whatever reason, and you have to eat before they give you the medicine or it's gonna make you sick. And they tried to explain it to him multiple times, and they're like, well, I'm busy, I have to go get his medicine prep, can you go get him what he needs? I was like, sure, that's part of my job. Um, and every time I asked him if he needed something, he was like, no, I'm good, I don't want it, I don't want this, I don't want that, and we're like, sir, you have to eat before you give your medicine, and you're extending this by a whole hour. Of course, we didn't say that, but I'm gonna be here an hour longer because I, I'm trying to help you, get you what you need, um, and he wouldn't take it. So a whole half hour went by, and the per second person who replaces me after my shift is over um, was an older, uh, white lady who's been there for a very long time. And when she walked in, he immediately just gave her a list of things that he wanted, like out, off the bat, didn't argue with her, didn't do anything with her. Um, so when I finished my shift, I, I was there when he told her that, and I was so confused just because I was like, I sat here spending over half an hour of my shift trying to get you what you need um, so you can get your medicines and you won't get sick from taking your medicine. And she was, he just gave her the answer in 2.2 .2 seconds without even thinking about it, so. Okay. I hope you're still considering a career in medicine after all that. <laughs> okay. Other comments, uh, stories, questions? Yeah, please. So uh, I'm not a provider. I'm a, actually an English profession, professor and a writer, and I'm a, a visiting scholar at the center this semester. But I just wanted to say how much I appreciate the, the, narr the focus on making narrative as a context and the whole discursive nature of, of your presentation and what you both are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I've witnessed this from a different perspective with both my own mother and my own mother-in-law. One was Canadian, one was British. They both came from very discreet you know, sort of closed-mouthed cultures, both white women, they would never have made any kind of overt racist or discriminatory comment. I mean, I rarely even a hint of anything even close, even in personal family life. And yet both of them, at the very end of their lives, ended up in emergency situations in the hospital. My mother-in-law was had been, um, had collapsed and had been alone for five days when she was finally uh, transported off to the hospital. They'd revived her a bit in the ER, and she had a male nurse. And she looked up at the male nurse, and the first sort of full sentence she uttered out of this medical emergency was she said to him, are you a homosexual? And he said, no, ma'am. And she said, but you're a nurse. And he said, yes, ma'am, I'm married, and I have three children. And I've often thought about that nurse. I was so grateful to him. My mother-in-law was you know, deranged in a certain kind of way from her situation and the way that he handled it. But I've thought about what he took home with him from that. And then the other one was my mother, a similar situation to my mother-in-law, who had had a mild stroke and was also in stage four lung cancer. And she was in a hospital that had a lot of um, nurses aides and people who did service, you know, um, in, the, in the, her unit who were from the Middle East and her complaints about them. She was terrified is that was how it manifested, and that they were terrorists. And in her case, she, the, the staff did accommodate her, and they put her up close to the, to the nurse's station and only had white patients go into her room. But the, re the reason I bring this up is because your presentation you know, demonstrates so much how important it is to find the stories behind all of these things and then to try to get inside them. So thank you both. I want to uh, try, at the risk of uh, being a bad guest, uh, and I am a guest, and I appreciate the, the gracious invitation, but I, wanna, I wonder if any of you who have had really nasty, mean, demeaning remarks directed at you personally would be comfortable saying something about how it made you feel or how it made you perhaps question your career choice, your, your competency to be a good doctor or be a nurse? Because um, there's a, is there an emotional bite that we haven't heard about yet for the person who's the brunt of these, of these comments? Mm -hmm. 
Lupita. Hi, me again. So, uh, so yes, I think there's there's a price to be paid for it. Um, you know, it doesn't just stop with that patient, especially for that that moment that you hear that. For the rest of the day, I honestly feel like it can almost compromise patient safety because you cannot separate being a human from being a physician. And so you react in the same way. Your cortisol levels increase, your catecholamines um, surge. And so it can make you um, be distracted in a moment by something that's very negative. And so it takes time to separate yourself, to go and talk to yourself, and to remind yourself of why you went into medicine in the first place. And unfortunately, in, in the hospital, time does not stop. And so you don't have necessarily the amount of time that it would take for you to regain um, kind of control of your emotions. And so you just carry it, um, which is why I think this is, a, this is a topic that has to be discussed not only for our medical st students, but also for undergraduates that are thinking of going into this, of what the cost would be to you and how do you navigate ways of dealing with these instances um, and, um, yeah, and the coping mechanisms that you, you do for the daily. <laughs> Um, sometimes occurrences of when this happens. Anyone else? I liked how you um, kind of laid out all of these issues and it reminds me of how it runs parallel to workplace violence or patient aggression against medical staff. And I think for two really hard-hitting topics, you also are highlighting that there's still so much work to be done in educating those going into the field, but then also changing that culture of those already in the field. And I feel like to a degree we're seeing that a little bit with workplace violence, where finally we're starting to say it's not okay but I'm hopeful that we'll get to a place where we're more serious about saying that this is not okay from our patients. Um, because I think what I have encountered for my colleagues, um, it feels as though all we can do, we can't change their mind and so we have to accommodate. And so following back up with them to let them know that they're our team member and we care about them is a great thing to do, but it's, difficult when you feel like the institution or the organization around you also puts somebody above you in your kind of emotional state when you're their employee. So that was just my feedback. Let me tell you about my sister. My sister is several years older than I. She went to medical school at a time where there were four women in her class of over 160, 170. She's the only one who ever practiced medicine. Two of them never did an internship, and one went to the laboratory right away. She was very close to my parents, and uh, she and I are fairly close. She would call me a fair amount in the days when you actually had to pay for the phone call. It wasn't an iPhone. She was advised as a fourth-year student to go into anesthesiology. And she was wondering why. Uh, she wasn't particularly good with her hands. In fact, she was downright clumsy. But a well-meaning professor said, you shouldn't get involved with patient care because the patients aren't going to want you, aren't going to like you. Be easy on yourself. Go into a field where literally they're asleep when you take care of them. She said, no. The reason I went into medicine was I wanted to help people. I wanted to interact with them. I wanted to care for them. It was hard for her. She was not a science whiz. She struggled with organic chemistry, said, why am I doing this? She had a really tough time her first year of medical school. Kept saying, should I drop out? Is this a mistake? As an intern, literally every week, she would have people either very subtly saying, now what's your name? Her name was on her name tag. And they would make up a Chinese sounding name. They would page her overhead with a Chinese sounding name that wasn't her name. She would call home in tears 
and say, I made a big mistake. Maybe I, I should drop out. She said, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe my professor was right. If people don't want me, why should I be trying to help them? Well, she stuck it through. Uh, she, at one point in her career, ran the University Health Services. And she was a wonderful doctor, really went the extra mile for her patients. But the toll, little comments, as well as really mean, nasty comments, like, you should go back to Korea where they can shoot you. We're not Korean, but we all look alike. So I think that for those of you who are the brunt of these three comments, I guess my hope is that it doesn't make you lose sight of why you want to be a doctor or want to be a nurse and the good you can accomplish. And for those of you who are in the room or hear about it, uh, she never got any support from her supervisors or chief of service for any of this. She didn't even want to talk to them about it because they said, well, maybe they won't write me a letter of recommendation because I'm not strong enough. So it's your problem, too. It's all of our problems. So let me just quick, uh, if I may, one of the things I wanted to ask as a question is whether offensive, demeaning, racist comments, whatever you want to call them, to healthcare workers differ from comments you hear in other settings. These comments aren't just in the healthcare setting. You hear them, you know, I can hear them on the bus in New York, uh, here in the airport. What is it about being a doctor or a nurse that both constrains us from not doing what we would do in a public setting, which is to walk away or say something nasty back? Uh, and I think it's because the ethical idea is that we are there in our professional role to help patients in need. Uh, and we generally try and set aside our aversion to patients to care for them. Okay, it's part of what we're trained to do, and it's hard. Uh, we talked about uh, some of this already, but I, I really want to underscore that doctors have rights and nurses have rights, and we have the right to be respected. Uh, and it's not just patients whom we should get be respected, but the people taking care of them. And I think it's okay to set limits, reasonable limits, on obnoxious, demeaning, racist patient behavior. It's got to be called out. It's got to be named. We're going to take care of you, but if you make comments like that, it makes it harder, and you won't get the care you need. Uh, and I actually think that the senior doctors, the attending physicians, the chiefs of service, the hospital administrators, and hospital policies have got to all be there to support the frontline workers. Uh, body talk. The one question that's changed, Kamani, I asked, what's changed since we published this article in 2016? A lot has happened, both good and bad. Uh, it almost seems like people are, their tongues are unchanged. Things that people may have been thinking in 2015, they're now actually saying and saying it loud and saying it often. Uh, I think one question that wasn't as big a question three years ago is, how should other team members and the institution help? And uh, you know, if you're at the Amtrak station or the airports, there's this phrase, say something, do something. And we're doing this now in many medical centers about sexual assault, sexual violence. You hear, see something, say something, do something. So it's now the problem of all the people who are witnesses to get engaged. Uh, I'd like to leave with a kind of a optimistic, maybe unrealistic comment. Medical care is delivered in a specific cultural and historical context. We're here in 2019. You're here at an institution. San Francisco's different, New York is different. Because there's something special about being a healthcare professional where you're there to try and help patients, 
I think we also can set expectations on patients. If you want us to help you, there are certain things that we can't accept. It's hard to have conversations about the kinds of topics we've been talking about, racially based, nasty, mean, demeaning comments. And maybe, just maybe, the hospital setting is a place where we can start to talk about it, and more than just talk, act on in a way that starts to set a model for respectful interactions with people who make the comments, people who hear them, and people who are the problem. So thank you very much, and I think we'd be glad to talk and answer questions after it as well. Thank you. Thank you both. And we do have time for um, a couple more questions if, um, since all of you were answering questions before your opportunity to ask questions uh, in our closing minutes um, is here as well. So does somebody have a question or comment? Yeah, or you're welcome to come on down and talk. Well, in the absence of, of any further questions, let me um, encourage you to come back next week. Um, our Medical Center Hour, importantly, next week will be held in the Medical Education Auditorium in the Medical Education Building, the third floor auditorium in the Medical Education Building. Um, it's the Alpha Omega Alpha Lecture of the School of Medicine, Leadership in Medicine 2020 and Beyond, What Will Doctors Be? Our speaker is Dr. Christine Castle, a presidential chair and visiting professor at UCSF and a former head of the American Board of Internal Medicine. Um, please join me in thanking Kimani Palamil and Bernie Lowe. Thank you. Thank you.